<clears throat> and yes, to Dale. Uh, ditto. <laughs> Hamlet said to Horatio in Act Five, Scene Two, almost at the very end of the play, he said, there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough you with them as we will. Do you believe that? I do. And if I can manage my emotions, what I want to do is tell you at this time when we've come together after all these years, I'd like to tell you how we met, how I got to you. I'm having a hard time. <laughs> this is overwhelming. Here's my story. I was in a New York City park one afternoon, watching over my two young kids. And I was meditating on Lady Macbeth's instructions to her husband. <laughs> about how to kill Duncan. <laughs> She said to him, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. And suddenly I thought, what is she saying exactly? Is she giving him disguise advice or telling him how to murder? And when I realized that was a choice, it was like a bolt of lightning. And I was aware of the huge power that an actor has to make such choices. It was a great awakening for me it's been a half century since that moment in the park, and I'm still doing that. <laughs> Three days ago, Paul Ryan was speaking to the House of Representatives. <laughs> Any of you hear him? <laughs> what he said was, uh, regarding the weight of the responsibility, he said, it's as though the sun, moon, and planets fell on me. And I thought, no, no, Paul. <laughs> That's not the target. <laughs> it's right, isn't it? It should have been the sun, moon, and planets all fell on me. That's what he tried to say. <laughs> Within months of that awakening, my husband had a career move that took us out of New York City to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Our house was two blocks from the Carnegie campus. My children were in elementary school, and I went and registered for the MFA program in directing and met Edith Skinner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd never heard of her at the time. Her classes were mandatory, and that was on the pathway. Her her classes were two-pronged, the International Phonetic Alphabet and the study of the melodies and usage of the English language, of spoken English. In other words, oral communication. We learned to score a written text like a piece of music. 
The first time I slowly read aloud a Shakespeare text according to all of the markings, such as degrees of vocal stress according to the meaning, pitch lifts, degree of emphasis, inflectional directions, I thought it was a miracle. At the end of the reading, I said, my God, I understand the whole thing completely. So this is the way you convey exact meaning. Two months before graduation, I was packing up our household for we were unexpectedly moving back to New York. Edith called me into her office to tell me the news that Juilliard was starting a brand new drama division and they wanted her to teach the speech work. But she was in a quandary. It was too soon for her to retire from Carnegie. And she had thought up this possibility that maybe she could fly in every weekend, teach a master class on Monday, and I could teach the rest of the week. Could I do that? Would I be interested in that? Four months later, I was sitting in a gymnasium in Connecticut, a girls' school, in a ring of people like John Hausman, Michel Sandini, a circus trainer, somebody doing mask work, Edith Skinner. What we were doing was teaching sample classes, discussing the curriculum, withdrawing, discussing it in detail, and compiling our, well, the, the curriculum, but examining our suitability. What did we have to do to get there? Um, we started the next month. Lincoln Center wasn't ready yet, just being built for us. And we taught in the open halls of Columbia. People walked through the classes discreetly as possible and we just carried on for that year. And then we moved into the building. In addition to Edith's classes, I was to teach a course called Non-Dramatic Texts. This was from the curriculum that Sandini developed for the young Vic in London. His goal was that actors should be able to get the meaning out of a text, which by the way, very few people can do. People are not able to interpret from the written page. So this was right down my alley. Just the thing I dearly hope to spend my time learning. Uh, we read from recipes. <laughs> Letters, diaries, history, instructions, anything other than plays. And my students, you too, learned to score a piece so that we would know where was it going, what, and had to analyze it in order to score it. Always it was the search for the exact meaning. Um, for eight years, I taught at Juilliard, learning and teaching and exploring. Uh, it was a wonderful place. New York was a magnet. All sorts of people, English actors included, came and visited, sat on the floor of the classroom with us. It was, it was a wonderful experience. Um, at, at an eight-year mark, 
my children were graduating, were, were graduating from high school on their way to college. And my husband and I decided to graduate from our marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and in the day, in the day following that decision, as we were ruminating, Jack Clay <laughs> called me. He was passing through New York from a session with Lecoq in Paris. And he said, we've just had a line opened up at SMU for a voice and speech teacher. Do um, you think you would, could consider it? And I said, well, if you had called me yesterday, I would have said, no, I have a family. <laughs> but I said, today I'm free and I'd like to talk to you. <laughs> well, is this not remarkable? <laughs> I went into New York. He came and visited Juilliard. And he said yes, and I said yes. And in August 1975, I arrived at SMU. So you have heard testimonies already about what that was like to come to. These two men <laughs> were my welcoming committee there. Extremely open, welcoming, spiritual men both. Uh, so there was an aura and a texture in the department that was perfect. And, and, that, and if we're talking about divine roots, in fact, when we set the August date and I climbed on the plane, I said to divinity, isn't this rather overt? Laughter